In 2013, it was Omari Varela. In 2016, it was Victoria Martins. And in 2018, it was Jeremiah Valencia. All New Mexico kids killed after experiencing horrendous abuse. Police, CYFD, and other agencies promised to do better to keep this from happening again. Well, it has. In December, four-year-old James Dunkley was killed, allegedly by his mother's roommate. His injuries, heartbreaking. And like in many of the previous cases, CYFD was involved, aware of possible abuse. So how did this happen again? That's what we wanted to find out. Today, we began a four-part series that shows there's not one simple answer, one agency or person to blame, but a system that still has much more work to do. He was a loving little boy. And four-year-old James Dunkley was loved. I mean, I, I'd walk in and see him and he'd run to me and say, Papa, and grab a hold of my leg and hug my leg. But the marks on his tiny body when he was rushed to the hospital on December 10th told a much different story. Paramedics tried desperately to revive the boy who wasn't breathing. Their efforts would fail, and four-year-old James Dunkley was pronounced dead. It was clear to everyone in the room that what happened to James was no accident. He had bruises on his left hip, his right hip, his ribs, his cheek, his thigh, bicep, ear, lower neck, the bridge of his nose, his elbow, the middle of his back, his buttocks, and both knees and shoulders. He had two knots on his head, a bloody upper ear, a bloody chin, scratches on his chest, neck, and chin, and a large portion of the inside of his bottom lip was missing. When doctors performed an autopsy, they also found a lacerated liver and pancreas, bruising on the lungs and intestines, a large amount of blood in the abdomen, and a skull fracture. It shouldn't have happened. There's no way it should have happened, and it should never happen again to anybody else. Kevin Nelson is angry. More wasn't done to protect his grandson. The four-year-old lived with Nelson for more than a year, dropped off, he says, by his mother when she couldn't care for him, bruised, hungry, smelling of urine with tattered clothes. Nelson says they took James in, took care of him, and he was happy. Then one day, CYFD and APD showed up to his door, saying she wanted him back. Nelson says he pleaded with them, warned them the boy would be in danger, but the boy was taken. Nelson says he never saw him again. He wouldn't learn until after his death that the boy was living with his mom, her friend, and her husband at the Cinnamon Tree Apartments on Central and Louisiana. That is where he was killed, allegedly at the hands of Zarek Marquez. I ask you, what's your reaction when you hear that a child has died who was under CYFD's radar as the head of this department? My reaction when I hear about any child dying is incredible grief because it's a great tragedy. I think New Mexico right now is in crisis for many reasons related to the overall well-being of our children and our families. We went to CYFD Secretary Brian Blaylock for answers. We wanted to know how much involvement CYFD had. According to court documents, CYFD had documented previous allegations of abuse perpetrated by the defendant. In fact, there was a safety plan in place where James was not supposed to be cared for by Zarek Marquez. What were those allegations of abuse? When did they happen? Who reported them? What did CYFD do about them? Why was the child not removed from the home? All questions James' grandfather has. He goes, I was in tears, and this caseworker and APD forced him to hand over this kid. This kid was dead several months later. What's missing there? So I can't talk about an individual case. It's an answer we get all the time from CYFD. Why? The Children's Code a state law which protects the privacy of children who are allegedly abused. It's against the law for CYFD to release information or records about a party to neglect or abuse to the public. The rules do change when a child dies. In that case, CYFD does have to release basic information about the child and a summary of the CYFD investigation into the case. 
CYFD says that will be done in the Dunkley case when that investigation is complete. This children's code keeps the public from knowing the whole story. Is there a right for people to know that? Is there a lack of accountability because there's not a lot of transparency? When a child like this, you know, situation happens, um, he's, he's all of our son, you know, he, he belongs to all of us, and we all need to learn from this situation. Transparency is absolutely key. Um, accountability, um, being able to understand exactly what happened in this case and the previous cases that have happened. Senator Michael Padilla has been working for years to improve New Mexico's children, youth, and family system. For him, it's personal. He grew up as a foster child. I came to the legislature wanting to work on this issue. Uh, my sisters and I always said if there was ever anything that we could do, we would do it, and, and here we are. Senator Padilla has made many changes he believes are making a difference long term, but there's still a problem. We have had some of the worst crimes against children um, in New Mexico over the past decade. And Padilla says that means there's much more work to be done. Something that really needs to happen here in New Mexico, and it's something that, you know, I intend to work on is if I continue to work, you know, as a senator here in New Mexico, and that is a complete and full rewrite of our children's code. Secretary Blaylock has been the secretary of the Children, Youth, and Families Department for a little more than a year now. The Dunkley case is the first highly publicized case under his watch. He says his office is already working to learn from it. But he does point out that there is a reason for privacy in child abuse cases, especially those where a child doesn't die. You don't want a youth to have something that's attached to them that is the result of the worst day of their life. So it's attached to them as a stigma that then follows them throughout their life. How do you balance that with accountability? If the public mm -hmm. doesn't know, how can we hold this agency accountable if we don't know the whole story. Mm -hmm. I think that's vital and so I think that's the constant tension for us. The secretary says they are working toward more transparency. We were told you can say nothing about that but now that we're digging a little further it looks like we can and so our communications, our external relations team, our lawyers all have the direction. We want to be as transparent as possible, give as much information as we can responsibly as long as it's in the best interest of our children and our families and as long as it's allowable under law. But that is just a piece to what is a very complicated puzzle. One thing that seems to be similar in some of these cases is a decision to keep the child in the home despite allegations or suspicions of abuse. How does CYFD determine that? We continue our series tomorrow at 4. We hope you'll join us.